Kishi got the Marbury and the Wahoki. Got Christie's Chapman lecture. Got Kakali put down Donna Gawan Chatler. Greetings, my people. Thank you. My name is Christy Chapman. I am of the Eagle Clan, born into the Turkey Clan. Today, I just want to give thanks to the indigenous people of this land for hosting this conference. Um, I'm grateful for all the people that are here who are present. Today, I'm going to tell you a little about tell you about a paper that I've been writing about. It's called black water. Black water is a term that I've chosen, a term that describes the word kapocha in Zuni that our elders use to describe a substance that would enter our community. Kapocha in Zuni, literal translation is bad water. But I've chosen black water to signify the dark, dark looking water um, and what black um, alcohol, um, the blackness of it, the, the dirty water of it has, has affected our tribe by devastating the uh, effects of our core values. Our elders have prophesied that it will enter our community one day and they didn't know when, but a hundred years have gone by and we now see what it has done to our community. So the Zuni, we have cherished and thrived on the core, our, our core values. The Zuni say that on Awilona created the galaxies, the universe, and all living beings. From On Awilona came the governing body of the Zuni. The governing body of the Zuni was a hierarchical um, order, which gave rules and rules, but responsibilities to these governing bodies. And it was when they were given this responsibility, they were given an oath, an oath for life, not to harm the people. They were entrusted by On Awilona, and they were given an oath again for life to follow his precepts in order that Zunis would have long life and longevity. So over the course of time, our core values that were given to the governing body of the Zuni that came from On Awilona, over time, these, these core values um, were transferred down from our families, our grandparents, our, our parents, our aunts, our uncles, our extended families, and this traditional, what we call traditional customers in the law, in teaching our core values has shaped, so it has shaped our way of life. And it, dic it dictated our social order for all Zuni. The core values that we hold strong to um, before Western influence, before the effects of alcohol on the right was respect, nurturing the young, language, honoring the elderly, family, unity, humility, faith, generosity, peace, resilience, wisdom, self-sufficiency, integrity. There is more, but this is just a few of the core values that we held dear to. But over the last hundred years, once alcohol has been introduced, black water has been introduced, we've seen what it has done to our community. We see disrespect. We see child abuse, neglect, and da child endangerment. We see the loss of our language. We see elderly abuse. We see an increase in crime, intoxication, DWI, domestic violence, murder, <coughs> rape, assault. Crimes that didn't exist prior to the introduction of black water. There were crimes that were commu committed against individuals such as murder and rape, but those were really minuscule in number. Once black water entered, we see the devastating effects. We see the poor health. We see, the, we see people who are supposed to be self-systems relying on others 
because of what it has done to them. Most of all, we see the death of the spirit and, and, and physical death from the effects of alcohol. Black water was first introduced sometime around 18, the late 1870s. And excuse me for the screen color, but there's something going on with the color of my, the back screen. But black water, the screen I know why is black, because black water entered. When it entered, there was no way of dealing with it because nobody knew how it would make a person feel. The late 1870s shows us that once it entered, they tried using balls to deal with the problem. And this, is, this quote is taken from one of the ethnographers, Matilda Cox Stevens, where she said, well, there's a law forbidding the sale of liquor to the Indians. The law is not executed. At least it wasn't up until 1896. The peddling of whiskey is begun weeks before Shalako. Every man in Zuni spends what little he has to use to buy the whiskey, the black water. So around this time, it was first introduced. And there are also other reports written to um, written by commissioners of Indian Affairs as they reported to Congress that they, in 1888, not seen here, but there were cases of drunkenness in the Pueblos, not just Zuni, and it was difficult to catch the offenders, they said, because Indians were fond of liquor and afraid to accuse those, excuse me, who sold them. So once it was starting to enter into our community, while well, we saw what it was starting to do to our men in the community. It affected the men first in that they, it was starting to pull their focus away from Onalunua's precepts, what our role was as Zuni people. And the following slides will show how the Zunis tried to deal with it. However, at the time, because they didn't know how it would affect them, the way they tried to deal with it wasn't working. And with Western influence, they tried to introduce Western jurisprudence or Anglo-American way of um, deterring our people from drinking alcohol. But what they were doing was imposing fines on our people to try and deter them, but it was insufficient. They were putting people in jail or under arrest, but again, it was insufficient. The, the slide as I go on will show how none of it is in effect, was effective. What is needed right now in Zuni is an interdisciplinary approach, kind of what we're seeing today in the conference, how everyone has been drawn together to unite, to make a change for our survival. For Zuni, when alcohol was introduced in the 1890s, we see that people were starting to get drunk and they were starting to fight. They were injuring one another. Here, this is taken from a case study that was not a case study, but from an ethnographer's, what he had asked Zuni informants to tell them about, and this is what they reported to him, how they, how Zuni started to deal with, with alcohol. Two people were drunk, they got in a fight, one was injured, the other was not. The injured sought compensation, and they met with the family for that. But however, they were, there was no resolve, because neither one wanted to accept the blame. So they took the case, their case, to the council. The council heard their case in front of the plaza. The, at the time, our, our leaders, our leaders were our secular leaders, civil leaders, what we consider now our governors and lieutenant governors. They were appointed by our hierarchical body from uh, those were the ones that designated our leaders at the time and these leaders when they heard the case, they decided that the injured one should receive compensation. 
and that compensation was in the form of a turquoise and shell necklace, buckskin, and a big rock, and some sheep. Over time, into the 1930s, they couldn't get a handle on alcohol. So what they started to do was seek outside assistance. Our secular leaders asked an outside official, a non-Indian, a non-Zuni, how to deal with a, a, a habitual drunkard and a bootlegger. They took their matter to an Indian agent. The Indian agent the Indian agent's recommendation was to send this man who had a family of three, it's not on here, he had a family of three, he had a family of, and a wife to take care of. What happened was they sent him to the penitentiary in Kansas, leaving behind his wife and kids. This was very atypical. And if it would happen today, that would violate uh, the Indian Civil Rights Act's due process. Things were getting worse. By 1949, there were 57 arrests made for drunkenness on the night of Shalako. The penalty at the time for drunkenness was $15. At the time, the tri our population in Zuni was 2,500. So the tribe looked to gain $855 for those arrested that night. Interestingly, that um, 57 individuals would be approximately 2% of our community being under risk at that time. Further, by 1950s, again, it was beginning to show that the imposition of fines was not doing anything to deter these men from alcohol. In 1950, another case shows that a man was drunk, he wrecked, and he was found by the sheriff at the time to be in possession of liquor. The man was brought before the council who he was able to stay with at his house to sober up. The following morning, because there was no standard penalty at the time, the judge had suggested a fine of $50, noting how the Anglo courts imposed the fine of a similar offense at $100. What was interesting about this case is that the judge spoke to the individual and told him not to be, to have hard feelings against the judge because the man was still also a part of the community. With that, moving forward, how the imposition of fines had no effect, I just want to highlight how In the past, Zuni's population was 2,500. Today, in 2015, or last year, 2015, our number was 11,581. And I'm gonna show you some slides how our population grew to fivefold. However, those being arrested for intoxication, drunkenness, has risen over 20-fold. In Zuni, over the years, Blackwater has introduced a number of criminal offenses which had not been seen earlier on. These are the numbers from Zuni. And unfortunately, you can't see from the slides, but from 2012 <coughs> to 2015, the number of criminal offenses is over 3,000. In 2014, that number was 4,988. The, the date I took the numbers from Zuni for the criminal offenses in 2015, the numbers were 3,240. That was only in September. So it could be surmised that the numbers went even further than that. But the criminal offenses in Zuni related to alcohol these were the top criminal offenses related to alcohol from 2012 to 2014. The number one was intoxication. Second one was disorderly conduct. The third, endangering the welfare of a child. The fourth, 
um, DUI with intoxicating liquors or drugs. As I had mentioned, in 1949, there was 47 arrests for intoxication. In 2014, there was 2,620 arrests for intoxication. That is a really high number. What's more disheartening is that alcohol has been the number one killer of our people. From 1994 to 2007, the percentage of death, alcohol-related deaths has risen from three, you can't see it on there, from 3.3% to over 24.4% in 2006. The next slide will show you where we're at now within the last, um, well, from 2004 to 2007. In 2000, from 2004 and 2007, the number of alcohol-related deaths is 22.5%. That 22.5% of death represents 47 indo individuals who lost their lives due to alcohol over a three year period. Men accounted for 22 of those deaths and 19% accounted for 25 for, for those deaths. We, as Zuni, I, as a Zuni, as a nurse, have seen the devastating effects of alcohol, and I want to call for action, because what, core, what Blackwater has done, it has affected our core values. Core values is the glue that holds our community together. Without core values, we'll lose our tribal sovereignty. The rise of alcohol-related deaths and the increase in alcohol-related offenses are a challenge and a wake-up call for us in Zuni, but in other communities as well who are similar to ours, this is taking place. We laugh a lot when we see our people drunk, when we see them intoxicated. We laugh. We're all here. We're all here. And we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. They told us black water would come. It is here now, and it has left the impression on our people. And we can no longer look, look and laugh. We must do something about it. The secular government is not the only one that has the solution. All of us must come together from the medical field to our, our religious, our cultural leaders, our secular government, our teachers. We must all join together in order for our young, to hold on and hold true to our core values. So collaborative, appro collaborative approaches is the message for today. All of us have been affected by someone who has, who has indulged in black water. I just wanted to share with you, as a nurse, I 
didn't introduce myself as a nurse, but in my heart, I'm a nurse. I'm a third year law student now. And as a nurse, taking care of my own people and seeing my aunts, my uncles, my grandfathers lose their life to alcohol, it's time that we bring this forward. With that, I just want to share with you this, this saying from another Indian from the real <laughs> Indian. <laughs> <laughs> A global view that's consistent with our tribal values, and that is that our beliefs become our thoughts. Our thoughts become our words. Our words become our actions. Our actions become our habits. Our habits become our values. And our values become our destiny. So I leave, we, I leave you with that. And I hope that this presentation stirs anger within you. But to change that anger to bring our people together so that we can help our mothers, our fathers, our grandfathers, our aunts and our uncles who are dealing and struggling with alcohol. My people are proud in that they were able to win back their lands. Whatever resource it took, they used it to fight for their lands. I ask my people now, Whatever resource it takes, we must find it to help our people. This is a Zuni saying I want to leave you with, and a Zuni saying that says, "Hon you must all hot kitchen, hon i an satenaw, hon teh wan illa pa, hon teh wan upnaw." Be honest and trustworthy to one another. We will help one another. It is your turn. It is my turn. It is time. Thank you. This is for the children. Thank you. My name is Sandra Prima and we'd like to do a traditional uh, welcoming and our dear brother that is from Thursday Island is a tr traditional elder and language speaker so he will open in traditional language and then I will translate what he said. Okay. Thank you everyone. Good afternoon everyone. I am deeply humbled here at your present. Um, we come from our country, uh, Australia. Um, I say Kri Daudai, that is Kri to, to us, not Australia, but it, it's not part of Australia. Um, <clears throat> I acknowledge the mighty creator, the great spirit and his son for everything they have installed for all of us to share. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that I'm standing on, and I give uh, respect to elders past and present and elders of the future. And I am honored to be here on behalf of our team from Australia. And thank you very much for welcoming us here on your country. So. Uh -huh.
My name's Sandra Cream. I'm a one-year Kalkadoon. Let me just get the question. There are over 350 million Indigenous peoples in the world. We are the traditional knowledge holders to the world. We had our voices taken away from us. This is through the laws and policies. We suffer gross human rights violations and face systemic discrimination and exclusion. That's what's happening for Indigenous peoples in the world. And I, my, what I'm going to speak about is about in Australia. And just quickly give you a bit, bit of a quick background. Uh, I have a, I'm a legal officer, I have a law degree, and I have been working in the legal field for quite a long time. I first started work in the Legal Aid Queensland, uh, and my work actually wasn't in human rights, it was actually in a lot of criminal work, doing murder cases, uh, grievous bodily harm, attempted murders, and victims of crime compensation. This is a map, it's close to what I could find. I didn't want to do a map of our states or our territories, but this is a map of Australia, of the, the different tribes that we have in Australia. For me, I'm up here, around this area, one year Kalpadoon. This is where my family come from. This is the area that my father, mother, and my ancestors belong. This is their land. This is where we are from, Louis Creek. It is no longer there, it is no longer on our map, but it is a place that we still go as a family. It's the spirit place for my family. It's the land to our law, and it has existed before colonisation. We had our customs and traditions handed down to us through the oral way, and we must continue to stand, hand down that traditional knowledge. When we go back to country, my family, we have to go in when we go into the water, we have to do it traditionally way. We don't just jump in and swim or anything like that. We have to first step out, not go enter into the water, we have to clean ourselves. And when we go back down, we have our, our native top, and then we can get into the water. The water must, we must be clean to enter into the water because we know how sacred water is. And when we go back for our native title meetings or anything like that, we don't say Aboriginal people because for me, my grandfather was all, my grandfather was Chinese, so we're considered yellow fella. They say yellow fella, black fella, white fella, where I come from. But when we are one year, we go back and we don't say that, we say we're one. We're not allowed to say black fella, white fella, yellow fella. But this is where, where my uh, grandfather, my father was born. My father lived out here till he was 17 years of age. There were nearly 12 in his family. They lived out here and then they had to go into town to live. They traveled by mule into a little, into a little uh, town called Camberwell. So this is where we lost. All our, all our culture and our language when they had to leave the land. Traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge. This is what I found what t traditional knowledge meant on the online. But that, that's not, that's not us. This is how it is in the Western world. This is what they put out what traditional knowledge is. This is the version. But we must remember what our traditional knowledge is. We must speak about what our traditional knowledge is. When we're out and we're talking to people, we, we are the educators for our traditional knowledge. So it's important that we explain to people what traditional knowledge is. We don't have to go to a dictionary. We don't have to go to the online and look at anything. We know from oral, we know here, we know here what our traditional knowledge is. So it's important that we educate what traditional knowledge is about. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to start changing and making the changes ourselves to what we know what is right for our, our mob, our, our people as Indigenous people. What I'm actually going to talk about next is about three cases that happened in Australia. And then I'll quickly discuss the human rights violations of those cases, but also about the determination and also about moving forwards in our human rights. 
And one thing we must remember that it is us to have our battles against the laws and policies that have been made against us. We have a right to protest, to get, voice our opinion and to take legal action. So we need to use our rights. But when we're fighting for these rights in such as su these cases, these three cases, we've got to go in with a good heart. We've got to go in with a strong heart. The legal system is not kind to us as Indigenous people. We don't have a lot of Indigenous lawyers and judges in the world. And it is a hard battlefield in there when you are practising as a lawyer. So as we know, under the existing intellectual property law, it does not give us recognition as a collective group. International, the intellectual property rights of people, it is only a pro, uh, for the rights for an individual property rights. This was designed for commercial and industrial growth. But for Indigenous people, our property rights is our traditional knowledge, our songs, our stories, paintings and dancing. They're all our collectives. It is passed down through to us as a collective in our tribes or our communities because this is our dreaming. It's our history, our laws, in how we are to be good stewards, to look after Mother Earth and each other. This is meaningful to us, to who we are. So what happened in Australia? There was a case called the Carpet Snake. I was very fortunate enough to do my legal practice training with the person who ran this, Colin Goldburn. And what happened is that they're out in a remote community in, in Australia is that some Aboriginal people out in these communities went and they put their artwork in a, in a museum to have a look at. There was this person, he went there and had a look and he seen this artwork. So from that artwork, what he decided to do was he was going to make carpets out of that. He started his own business then he made the carpets from Vietnam and deported them back into Australia, $4,000 each. He was, people were paying for this carpet. But what happened was that these people out in a remote community, someone had seen, seen that artwork on the carpet and they contacted them. Then they lodged a claim in the courts that this was their collective right, this was their story. What was on the carpet was their painting, their story to what their history was, their story as a collective group. But as we know in the intellectual property world, it's very difficult for us to prove our rights in a collective voice. So Colin took this on and Terry Jenkins, she's an Indigenous lawyer who does intellectual property rights, she also helped him with this. So what happened was that, cut a uh, long story short, is that they won. Because also in Australia, in the art law, you have a moral obligation. And they threw this in the case, that they have a moral ob obligation. So this guy, he had to then, he said that he tried to contact them and he tried to get their um, permission to use it. That didn't happen. But after they won, he was supposed to pay them 1100 uh, $1,108,000 1, compensation didn't happen because he went bankrupt. But the bottom of the line was at least they took it on. And this is what we have to do in our human rights when we are violated, especially when it comes to our traditional knowledge and the way that we hand it down. The next case is Joe, John Kawada versus Joe Yucky Peterson. This is in the same area of where, around where I come from. This was a, it was a WIC nation from Arakoon region of the Cape, Cape York Peninsula. What happened was that John Kawada and the stockman at that time, in 1974, they wanted to buy the large area of land where they were, where their traditional land they wanted to buy it back. They went to their Aboriginal Land Fund Commission and said, can you help buy us the land? They said yes. So they went to the guy and asked him, he was an American man, he was leasing the land at that time, and they said to him, can we buy this land? He said yes. But our Premier, in 1974, Aboriginal people did not own their, a large area of land in my state. The Premier said, no, we're not selling it to him because Aboriginal people are not allowed to own a large area of land. On the day they were going to dot it, stopped. John Kawata took it to the, to the Human Rights Commission Racial Discrimination 
saying that they were discriminated against for buying, for wanting to buy the, uh, a large area of land. The premiers, he said, no, that doesn't matter. He then took it on and uh, took it on, and it went further. And he he fought it. He did not want to, want it to own it. So what he done is he ended up turning it into a national park. Sadly, John Kawata passed away. This is the Kakadu Plum. This is a very big case in regards to Mary Kay. So the Mary Kay product, Kakadu Plum, a guy was visiting the Northern Territory. And what happened was that he seen the Kakadu Plum and he was doing a documentary on it and the Aboriginal people showed him about this plum. So what he did was he took it back and found it and analysed it and found that it had a whole lot of vitamin C's in it. And what happened then? Word gets about Mary Kay then wanted to add the Kakadu plum, extract it and put it into their products. So they, they began, be, began extracting it and doing and then what happened was the Aboriginal people, the Meow people in Northern Territory said they opposed this. And they said this was their medicine because Mary Kay then wanted to patent it. So there was a legal challenge about this. In the end, what happened was it didn't get patented. So one of the things that we must do, and also just before this, is that I just want to say with John Kawata, what happened was that in 1910, the Premier of that day, Anna Bly, she handed back 75,000 hectares of National Park to the Wick people, and again, sadly, John Kawata was there. But what happened was that even though we fight a legal challenge and he didn't get that at that time, we had a case that came up and then gave us our native, native title rights. And finally, in what year was it, 1982, we finally overturned, it overturned the Terra Nullis in 1982, 1992. 1992. That's how long it took us to overturn Terra Nullis and for them to recognise that we were the original owners of our land. So even though Joe Kawada had started this case, it's the empowerment that we give each other. We may not win, we may not lose, we may lose. And it's very disheartening when you, you're working on a case and you lose. I work in a tribunal with people who are discriminated against. There are times when we win, there are times when we lose. And especially to my Indigenous brothers and sisters, it's very disheartening when we do lose. Because I know the battle that they are having with inside them. Sometimes when you go into the legal system with Aboriginal people, it, I can tell you the legal system and a challenge for some people, it can seriously break the spirits. But at the end of the day, it's that determination that will get them through, that they want to see justice, that they want to see equality for who they are as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their country. So our laws and policies were not written for us. They did not include us. But it is us who are making the change in the world because we are one of the largest human rights movements in this world. We are changing the world and that's what we need to recognise. We are making changes. It may be very slow. It may, it may be a long process, as with our Marbo case. It took 10 years for us to get native title. It can be a long process. But it is us who are empowering each other. And it is us who are doing what we need to do because we are not the invisible people. We have a culture, language and customs and we are, are the traditional knowledge holders to the world. So we must continue with our battles and we must continue with our fight. And we must continue as one. It is very important that we have a look at precedents that have been set down in the world as Indigenous peoples. This, some of these cases just don't happen in Australia. There are cases I know out in South America where they use the Declaration of, for Rights of Indigenous People <coughs> and they have one. So when we're looking at battles, don't hesitate. Don't think, oh, you know, I may lose that. Yes, you may lose that. But again, it's the battle of going through and making those changes. And we have had many cases in Australia and they are from people who just, who, who are our brothers and sisters. Some of them have never gone to school. Some of them have 
you know? Another case in Australia was uh, Vicky Roach. What happened was Vicky Roach, she was born in a very sad situation, put into care. Her mother and father, she was an alcoholic, she was a prostitute. She, what happened was that she was driving a car while she was on probation. She seriously injured somebody. She had to go to jail for a long time. But at that time, there was an amendment to our election act. And the amendment was that anybody who was serving an indictable offence or a lot were not allowed to vote in a federal election. But we had a change, uh, Kevin Rudd, as a lot of you know, who have gone to the UN, he was going into a federal election. Vicky Roach wanted to vote for him. So what she did was she challenged the system and took it all the way to the High Court and said, I want to vote, but the, the Election Act and the amendment said you can't vote on an indictable offence. People who are in prison on a long-term long offence can't vote in a federal election. She said, I have a right. I have a constitutional right that everyone has a right to vote in this country. She took it to, to court. An Indigenous woman took it all the way to the High Court in Australia and won so that every prisoner then had the right to vote in a federal election. This is what empowerment is about. And this is what our human rights are about. We all have a right to be a voice, to use our, and to exert our right. And we all have a right to be able to support one another and to be able to walk as Indigenous peoples. We are the steward to this earth. We have to look after our Mother Earth as well as we have to look after each other. Thank you very much. What a mother ready. Okay, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon. Shannon has been doing this for a long time. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get this plugged in? They saved the worst for last. Oh. Incarceration culture up on the top. Ask the cameras to go off. 